So, after yet another one of the hiatuses that I seem quite unfortunately to be often inclined to take, I'm back again to continue my video series on the origins of modern thought. And the subject of this video will primarily be René Descartes. I'm going to be discussing Descartes' life and some of his ideas. I'm also going to be giving uh, certain relevant historical background in order to put all of the other things that I want to say in, into context. And then after I finish doing all of that, I plan to devote a little bit of time to discussing the mind-body problem. I want to do this first because it's just an interesting problem in its own right, uh, but also and also because uh, in Descartes' work he was quite concerned with it. It's it's a central issue in his philosophy. But there's a further uh, point to my choosing to discuss that in this video, and that is that I want to be able to compare how modern thought approaches a certain traditional paradigmatic philosophical problem versus how pre-modern thought, like, for example, medieval scholasticism or Thomism, might uh, choose to approach that problem. So, that w so when I discuss the mind-body problem, I'm going to first you know, state the problem, explain the issues, and then try to explain how certain modern philosophical problems, uh, modern philosophical approaches approach the problem. And then how uh, what something called hylomorphism, which is essentially the, the Thomistic view of mind, approaches it, so that we can have uh, an example of modern thought and pre-modern thought compared. Uh, now, the reason I want to do this is, of course, uh, for anyone who knows who Descartes is, you're probably aware that Descartes is widely traditionally considered to be the founder of modern philosophy. He's one of these. Uh, important figures in intellectual history from which, from whom, uh, modern thought really comes into its own and becomes its own sort of thing. Now, in, in the previous videos in this series, I've been discussing things like nominalism, humanism, and Protestantism, which certainly have uh, adumbrations or foreshadowings of what is commonly considered modernity, but it is really with Descartes and with the philosophical naturalism that he and a number of others helps to inaugurate and bring to the fore, that modernity really comes to its own. And we really get um, a system of, of thought and, and intellectual construction, a general kind of Weltanschauung, if you will, that really can be called modern. Now, you may recall that in the previous videos in this series, I as I've mentioned, discussed humanism and Protestantism as responses to nominalism and as attempts to deal with the problems caused by the omnipotent God posited by William of Ockham and his followers. When I discussed the debate between Luther and Erasmus, uh, the point of this was, of course, to show that the worldview presented by humanism and the worldview presented by um, Protestantism ultimately comes into conflict. These two worldviews are irreconcilable. And I mentioned that in order to get around the, the, the problem caused by this conflict, thinkers began eventually to turn to the natural world, to center their metaphysics not on man or on God, as humanism and Protestantism respectively had done, but to center it on nature. And from this you, you get uh, philosophical uh, naturalism. Now, of course, uh, in connection with all of this, um, we're going to be discussing Michael Allen Gillespie's book, The Theological Origins of Modernity, and much of what I say will be drawn from this book, although, of course, I will be uh, bringing in other threads into the discussion as well. Okay, so with that prelude um, having been given, with that plan having been set down, let's finally get to business. Now, um, first, a bit of general historical background. After the Reformation, after Luther had posted his, his 95 Theses, because of the existence of the printing press, and because there were certain princes throughout Europe in whose interests was to stand against Rome, Lutheranism began to spread all over Europe like wildfire. 
already in 1520, you had Zwingli starting up his own reformist movement in Switzerland, for example. In 1529, in England, um, you had Henry VIII's uh, break with the Pope, which was finally finalized in 1536, when Henry formally broke off from the Roman Catholic Church and formed the Anglican Church. That same year, 1536, uh, John Calvin published the Institutes of the Christian Religion, which of course is the foundational text of Calvinism, um, and he had a tremendous influence on the development of Reformation thought in, in places like Hungary, uh, Germany, parts of France with the Huguenots, and so on. Um, now, in response to this growth in Protestant thought, the Catholic Church naturally uh, reacted. So, for example, um, in uh, 1546, not long thereafter, Ignatius Loyola formed the, the Jesuit order. I'll be discussing him very briefly uh, later on. Um, also, you had the Council of Trent, which, uh, at around the same time, which standardized uh, church doctrine and sort of eliminated the, the kind of pluralistic Christianity that one saw during the Renaissance. Renaissance Christianity... Um, although it didn't necessarily embrace things like Hermeticism, it at least tolerated them. With Trent, and with what had been happening as a result of it, that ended. Uh, the Catholic Church perceived the, the Protestant threat and realized that, that orthodoxy had to be set down and, and defended rigorously, and that deviations could not be tolerated. This was all a result of this kind of uh, sort of fermenting tension. Now, with this fermenting tension. Um, it obviously was only a matter of time before things eventually would come to a boil, and of course they did. Um, and warfare erupted all over Europe uh, shortly thereafter in this period. Now these wars that I'm about to discuss now, they're colloquially referred to as the wars of religion. And though it is not completely senseless to refer to them as such because there were religious motivations underlying them, it should also be kept in mind that there were other factors operating uh, in these wars. For example, um, they were the wars that really had to be fought in order for the, the nation-state, as it's known now, the kind of post-Westphalian nation-state, to come into its own and to really become the, the, the sort of thing that it went on to become. So this isn't purely a religious issue, although the religious angle will be what I focus on, and it will be sort of primary to the discussion. So, uh, the first of these wars broke out in Germany in 1546 and lasted for nine years, did not end until 1555, and in 1555 the, the Peace of Augsburg was uh, established. Now, the Peace of Augsburg um, established the principle of cuius regio eius religio. Um, this Latin phrase really can't be translated into English in any kind of pithy way, but what it essentially means is that he whose realm is under concern, the, the person whose realm it is, namely the king, is the one who gets to determine the, the religion in that realm. So that sort of became the, the, the operative principle from that point on. France also, from the period of 1562 to 1598, was torn apart and just almost utterly rendered together by horrific violence and warfare. There's a period of, I, I believe, nine wars, just, just in between those, uh, those 36 years, from 1562 to 1598. Uh, you had things like the War of the Three Henrys, um, you had, or, or the War of the League, which was, I think, the final, of those, the final one of those wars. And this period of warfare, which included things like the, the massacre of St. Bartholomew's, uh, Bartholomew's Day, where thousands of Huguenots were slaughtered. Um, there was even a story that uh, the Pope was presented with a, a medallion um, showing the, the head, I believe it was, of, of the, uh, the uh, slaughtered Huguenot leader. And he rejoiced at this. There's all kinds of just horrible slaughter resulting out of this conflict and these tensions. So, um, so the, the warfare in France ended in 1598 when Henry of Navarre, who up to that point had been a Protestant, had decided opportunistically to convert to Catholicism. And um, 
essentially he became Henry IV, King of France. He famously said, Paris is worth a mass. In other words, it's worth it to convert to Catholicism if it means that as a result of doing so I can become king, uh, which is what happened. Um, also, um, in Germany, you had all sorts of uh, things going on, in particular the Thirty Years' War, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, of course, e even with the end of the war and Henry's accession to the throne, the chaos in France didn't end. In 1610, uh, Henry was assassinated. Um, upon accession to the throne, he had um, proclaimed what's called the Edict of Nantes, which essentially was um, an edict was essentially an edict from the king, which granted a limited degree of religious toleration and royal protection to the Huguenot communities within France. It, it granted them fortified cities, uh, royal support for their pastors, uh, toleration within certain limits, and so on. Now, upon Henry's uh, assassination in 1610, um, things erupted into chaos again, and by 1624, Cardinal Richelieu had come into power. Upon coming into power, he vowed to break the Huguenots, and he kept his word. In 1627, he captured New Rochelle, which is a major Huguenot stronghold, um, and, and just began the work of, of utterly uh, you know, decimating and, and persecuting the Huguenot communities. Um, Although the Edict of Nantes was not formally rescinded until 1685, by 1629 it had been de facto rescinded because, uh, because uh, Richelieu had issued all sorts of proclamations limiting tolerance for Huguenots and so on. That's France. Now, uh, moving on to Germany. Uh, well, really the Holy Roman Empire uh, at this time. The Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Ferdinand II, was an ardent Catholic, and uh, he vowed to eliminate Protestantism in all of his territories. Now, fortunately for him, one of his territories was Bohemia, which was a Protestant area. Uh, in response to Ferdinand's declaration, Bohemia revolted and declared allegiance to Frederick, Elector of the Palatinate, who was the champion of the Protestant cause in the area. So, um, they had essentially declared allegiance to him, and he had maintained control of Bohemia for about a year. I believe this went on from uh, about October of uh, 1619 to then November 8th, uh, 1620, where he was defeated at the Battle of White Mountain. Um, and I'll discuss that briefly later on as well. Um, now that now this uh, that wasn't necessarily the the cause of the war, but these were the things going on. There were other things, and the Thirty Years' War is a very complex event. But essentially, there was all kinds of horrific warfare in the German territories. And although in 1635, with the Peace of Prague, warfare within Germany specifically had ended, by that time other European states like France and Sweden had been dragged into the conflict, and the war had assumed um, essentially p almost pan-European proportions. It, it became an enormous thing in which most of the relevant uh, players on the stage in Western Europe were involved. And this war lasted until 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia. On the tail end of this war, so this war, this war went on from, for 30 years, 1618 to 1648, but on the tail end of this war, you also had, going on, the English Civil War, which lasted from 1642 to 1651. So the, the point of discussing all of this is to really just set the stage and indicate to those watching that the period that I want to discuss, the, the period in which Descartes grew up and lived, the sort of um, culture, the zeitgeist in which he was immersed and so on, was an extremely chaotic one. And that his thought can be seen in many ways as a reaction to this chaos. He saw the world as thrown into disarray, uh, searching for any kind of moorings, any kind of uh, rational principle of organization to keep all of the, the, the chaos at bay. And you can say that this led him on his philosophic quest for certainty. So this is the sort of Era, the time in which Descartes lived, and the sort of thing that he was uh, reacting to. Uh, 
Okay, now let's let's get to talking about Descartes' uh, life. Uh, Rene Descartes was born in 1596. Uh, he was born near the um, near the city of Poitiers in France. Actually, I, I believe the the village that he was um, originally born in was eventually renamed and is actually now called Descartes. Which you know, how, how cool is that to get your own hometown named after you? Um, but uh, so Descartes was was born in this area. Uh, his mother died when he was one, probably from complications due to childbirth. And his father went on shortly thereafter to marry another woman. Um, he was left as a child in the care of his maternal grandparents, and also a man, also his his great uncle, who was a man named Michel Ferrand. He was a a local uh, judge or magistrate in the area. In fact, many of the male members of Descartes' family were lawyers, judges, magistrates, and so on. They had um, legal careers of one type or another, and it was expected of Descartes that he would pursue uh, a, a similar path in life. Now, he eventually chose not to do this. He rebelled against the wishes of people like his father, and there's some reason to think that he did this because he felt that it was what he was called to do, that is, that he was called to philosophy, but also that he regretted um, rebelling against his parents. And there's some speculation on um, psychological issues that that may have engendered. It's, it may be interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll get into that in a moment. That, that, that will be germane uh, later on, what I want to discuss. So, um, when Descartes was 10 in 1606, he was sent, along with his older brother, to the Jesuit school at La Fleche, which had been established by Henry IV two years earlier. Um, it was a school run by Jesuits, who, who were essentially a Catholic society that was, that was formed in response to Protestantism, to combat Protestantism, to, to protect Catholics who lived in, in Protestant lands and so on. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the order, was a military man, and so it was was organized around a very, a very kind of militaristic structure of, organi of organization to, to the, the Jesuit order. Of course, they, uh, the Jesuits, many of them, were also fantastic scholars. Um, but that's, that's another subject. So this was a Jesuit school. Um, Descartes went there and was given an extremely uh, rigorous education. He studied um, Aristotle and Aquinas in metaphysics. He read Suarez and Lessius in his classes on moral philosophy. He read Augustine. He read essentially all the works of the major nominalist thinkers, people like Gabriel Beale, Robert Holcott, uh, Marsilius of England, and so on. Um, he was also probably familiar with the medical works of uh, people like Francisco Sanchez, the mathematical works of uh, Oresme, Nicolas Oresme, who was also an economist, by the way. He wrote a, a wonderful uh, treatise on money, um, again, just as an aside. Um, but he was, he was greatly familiar with all of these theological debates surrounding the, the realism-nominalism issue. Um, although the, the sort of counter-reformation Catholic metaphysics that, um, that he had, had been trained in in his schooling was one that essentially had already begun the process of moving toward nominalism. Suarez, ontologically and metaphysically speaking, was not quite as strong of a realist about universals as was Aquinas. Suarez seems really to adhere to something called trope theory. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go deep into that because I'd veer off course if I did. Um, if anyone's interested about what that is, I'll, I'll explain that I can explain the differences. But essentially, the, the, the Counter-Reformation Catholicism had been less ontologically realist to begin with than was the, the more original kind of medieval Catholicism from which our whole story in this series of videos started. So uh, he was educated in all of this. In addition to this, uh, he was given a fine humanist education. He read Michel Montaigne. Uh, he read uh, people like Charon, who was a, a French humanist and also a skeptic, greatly um, influenced by the work of ancient skepticism. Um, also, uh, he was even allowed uh, access to the uh, school library at La Fleche, and he used this opportunity. He, he had unrestricted uh, access to the entire library. He used this opportunity 
to read uh, many of the, the occult texts that were there, hermetic texts, alchemical texts, Gnostic texts, uh, things, that, um, things that were quite far off the path of any kind of Orthodox Catholicism. And he, he spent his time at this school reading these books, and there's a lot of reason to think, and I'll go into this as I go on, uh, that this experience of reading all of these alchemical and hermetic works uh, greatly influenced Descartes in his later intellectual development. Now, um, so that's, that's essentially what his education was like. Um, in 1614, he uh, graduates from La Flèche with his BA, uh, so he's about 18 now. And uh, then he goes to get his, uh, licens his license in uh, canon and civil law, which he successfully manages to do two years later. Now, after this, because Descartes was a second son, not a firstborn, uh, in 1618, he's placed in the peacetime army of Maurice, Prince of Orange. Now, in this in this earlier period, um, although he he is a soldier now, um, there he doesn't really see any action at this point. In fact, there's no reason to think that uh, he saw any fighting or any action at any point uh, during his military career. There are some early biographers of his who think that he may have participated in this or that battle or this or that atrocity, but they usually tend to be um, people engaged in a kind of uh, propaganda war for either the Catholic or the Protestant side, and so what they say uh, should be taken with a grain of salt, and furthermore there's counter evidence against these assertions. The point is that during his military career it's unlikely that Descartes saw any action. So once he was stationed with Maurice's army, he was sent to Holland, um, but instead of fighting, he spent the next uh, few years in, in Holland uh, studying military architecture and mathematics. So just doing more of intellectual stuff. Um, and it was in this, this period when he was in Holland that one of the decisive things uh, happened to him in his life which uh, changed the course of his entire uh, development. And that was that he met a young uh, physician and thinker named Isaac Beekman and became great friends with him. Beekman was, was kind of a mentor to Descartes and really uh, pushed him on the, uh, the, the path that intellectually would be decisive for him. It was a formative influence for him. Um, so Beekman was a philosophical talent in his own right. And not long after meeting Descartes, he was able to perceive this, uh, this young man's uh, great intelligence, his uh, gifts for philosophy, and so on. And he tried many times to encourage him to pursue a, a philosophical life, a life of contemplation as a thinker, as a searcher for truth, and so on. Um, together with Beekman, uh, Descartes read many mathematical texts. He read all sorts of uh, hermetic and alchemical texts as well. So you can see him moving deeper into hermeticism, into Gnosticism, into uh, occultism and that sort of thing. I'll, I'll, I'll be discussing that also briefly because as I said, this is all an important uh, form of influence on, on Descartes and, and the man and the thinker that he later became. Um, so he spent some time with, with uh, Beekman. And, uh, but rather than immediately agreeing with Beekman's suggestion and devoting himself to philosophy, um, he decided to go to Germany. Because remember, by this time, the Thirty Years' War had begun. So this is about in, this is about in 1619. Um, so he went to Germany via Copenhagen. And while he was there, in November of 1619, he was in a German village near Ulm, and he was waylaid by the winter. The, he would, he'd gotten caught in a snowstorm, and he essentially had to stay in this village and uh, couldn't couldn't go anywhere. So he used the time that he had, so the story goes, to sit in a stove-warmed room, and he began a day of feverish thinking, in which he began to contemplate what would be necessary for one to be a great uh, scientist, 
a great uh, technician in terms of things like architecture or city planning, and also a great lawgiver. Um, so he was thinking in terms of pure science, but also in terms of uh, the, the, the social order. I guess what you could call social science or social and political administration. So, I mean, just to set the scene here again, he's sitting here in the midst of this chaotic war. He's sitting in this little village in Germany which had been built over the centuries in a haphazard, unplanned way. Uh, he sees that subjects are revolting against a king, the Bohemians revolting against uh, Ferdinand. They are revolting against him presumptuously. They are doing so without good sense. And they're doing so because their king, also presumptuously, had decided to uh, limit toleration of their religious beliefs. So, all around him, he's seeing a world which is just sort of chaotic and hobbled, hobbled together haphazardly without any kind of um, coherent, encompassing, rational plan behind it. And this troubles him. So this can be seen as, as that which, uh, which is, is motivating uh, his reflections on this day. So, on November 10th, 1619, he spends the day in feverish thinking. He begins first reflecting about these, um, these uh, more social issues, but then he turns his mind to uh, metaphysical subjects, and he begins to say, uh, can I establish an indubitable uh, point of certainty, something that cannot be doubted? And he, he then undergoes the process that, that he describes in his works. Now, um, the, the first of these um, is right here. You see his, his Discourse on Method. Now, see this, this particular copy that I have here is the Discourse on Method and his Meditations. But I also have this other uh, copy of the Meditations here, which is better because it has the objections and the replies appended to it. But these are his two major works, the Discourse on Method and the Meditations on First Philosophy. And now, Descartes sets down a method for attaining truth. And he, he says this in the discourse. He says, first, um, I had he says, I had resolved to doubt everything that could possibly be doubted, to see whether there was something which I could not doubt, and thereby try to establish uh, a certain uh, philosophical and scientific method uh, on that basis. Now, his, his original plan was to create a science. He wanted to... Uh, he had read Galileo's work, by the way, and was greatly intrigued by people like Galileo and Copernicus, and he wanted essentially to continue their work, but he wanted to do it from a certain uh, indubitable philosophical foundation. Now, of course, from this, uh, he, he follows the path of doubt. He realizes that uh, he, he must take all of what he sees by way of his senses as illusions because that's what they could be. Every thought that enters his head is dubitable because everything could be uh, some kind of sophisticated dream. The results of all his reasonings must also be doubted because he sometimes makes mistakes in reasoning and so on. And he eventually arrives from all of this to his, his fundamental uh, principle, which is that he himself exists. He says, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Um, that in trying to doubt his own existence, he realized that he is there doubting it, and as someone doubting that, he therefore must exist. And so his own existence cannot be doubted. This is, this is how he, he, he reasoned. Now, I'll, I'll go into this more deeply when I discuss Descartes' ideas, but first a few additional points about uh, the history of his, uh, of, of his life, and so on. So, um, now I mentioned that this day of feverish thinking was uh, November 10th. It's interesting because um, Descartes, uh, later on in his life, and really all throughout his life, ascribed a kind of mystical significance to uh, this, this day. Um, and many important events in his life actually happen at or very close to that day. So, for example, November 9th, 1614, he gets his B.A., November 10th, 1616, he gets his license to practice law, November 10th, 1618, he meets Isaac Beekman, the year after that, November 10th, 1619, is his, his great uh, day of thinking. Um, you know, then also, 
um, in 16, on November 11th, uh, 1620, he writes down uh, in one of his notebooks, and I'll be discussing that notebook in a moment because it's important, but he writes down in one of his notebooks that he had finally realized, presumably the day before, on November 10th, just what the implications of the method that he had established the year before had been. He had sort of been working on coalescing everything, bringing it together, setting it down into a coherent uh, kind of philosophical system. Um, there's also a case where in, in November, November 10th, uh, 1640, uh, he writes to Marin Mazin, who was a, a friend of his, was a Catholic monk, and probably the person most responsible for, for getting Descartes' ideas out there, that he had just finished one of his important manuscripts and had sent a copy of it to Christian Huygens, and, and so on. So there are all sorts of things that happen to him on this day, November 10th. It's, it's, very, it's very interesting. Now, I mentioned his connections to uh, and his interest in uh, hermeticism, Gnosticism, alchemy, that, that sort of mysticism. Um, this all had a, a great influence on him. Um, when he was in Germany, he um, encountered many thinkers who were interested in something called Rosicrucianism. Uh, now, the reason that he found all these people in Germany is that they had uh, come over uh, from England. The, the, the originally, um, these kind of uh, thinkers and philosophers interested in, in occultism and magic and all this kind of stuff that had come over from England to, to Germany. The, and the reason they had come over from England to Germany is that the daughter of uh, King James of England and Scotland had married uh, Frederick, the Elector of the Palatinate. The daughter's name was Elizabeth. Elizabeth had married Frederick, and this marriage produced this kind of cultural exchange between certain German territories and England. So when Descartes was in Germany, he encountered many of the people interested in, in Rosicrucianism and became very taken with these people. Um, a, a brief discussion of Rosicrucianism, and by, by the way, um, uh, some of this will be coming from, from this book that I have here. It's very interesting. By Tobias Churton, The Invisible History of the Rosicrucians. Now, this, this sounds sensationalized, but it's actually a, a reasonably you know, quite good work of history. There's also a, a, a documentary film somewhere on YouTube made about them where he essentially repeats the thesis of the book, which in a, in a moment I'll get to. Um, if, if I'm able to find a link to this documentary, I'll, I'll provide it in the description. Uh, you should you should watch it because it's it's fairly interesting at least if you're into this sort of thing. Now, uh, okay, so about Rosicrucianism, uh, the main thing to understand is that Rosicrucians were uh, sort of a, a secret order, or they styled themselves to be a secret order of uh, Protestant thinkers who came together almost in response to the Jesuits because the Jesuits were also quite a secretive society. The, the Rosicrucians initially were almost like the, the Protestant analog to this. And like many of the Jesuits, they were scientists. But they were this, this um, what looks today like a bizarre cross between a, a scientist and a magician because they subscribed to all sorts of alchemical, occult, and hermetic beliefs. So for example, Rosicrucians typically believed that um, the secrets of nature could be unlocked when um, one had sort of been illuminated by the spirit of truth. And the way to do this would be to clear your mind of all illusions of sense, um, to, because things that we perceive by the senses are, are illusory. Um, they're... Um, I guess you could say, uh, sort of epiphenomena in the sense that they're not what the, the true underlying reality is. They're illusory, and if we want to get to the truth, we should ignore them and focus instead on intellectual substance, because that was the division that they had made. There was intellectual substance on the one hand, which was uh, pure and, and original reality. And then there was what, what they called extension. Now, by extension, what they meant is um, anything sort of spatially located, that could be described in, in a mathematical sense, that, that one can just sort of plot locations on a, on a mathematical, uh, uh, mathematical plane or, or what have you, and, and describe them that way. Now, uh, for anyone familiar with Descartes' ideas, this should get your, this should 
get you to raise your eyebrows because Descartes also drew this uh, distinction between intellectual substance and extension. And he also, as I just briefly mentioned, when he went on the, the path of doubt, committed himself to doubting all of the, the things of his senses as being somehow uh, illusory and not ultimately real. This, this is very hermetic. This is very Rosicrucian. This whole path of doubt that he follows uh, was very much inspired by what he had, had seen from, from reading these people's texts and from interacting with them. So, so they were these uh, scientists slash magicians, the Rosicrucians were. And they published uh, three manifestos. Uh, the first came out in 1614 called the Fama Fraternitatis, the fame of the fraternity. And it was written by a man named Johann Valentin Andrei, who also wrote, um, who also wrote the second, and the, well, he wrote all of them. He's responsible for all the, the uh, Rosicrucian manifestos. But this first one essentially announced um, that uh, they were this secret brotherhood and so on. Now, because of the um, tensions of the time and the Catholic Protestant conflict, this provoked a lot of anxiety among people because there was also there were all sorts of stories floating about of secret societies and intrigue and this sort of thing. And so this this worried people very much. The Catholic authorities in particular were very wary of Rosicrucians and and set about trying to persecute them in various ways. And Descartes even got himself into hot water later on because people were aware of his uh, Rosicrucian connections. So, so this first manifesto sort of declares that there's this secret brotherhood of, of, of you know, truth seekers out there. And then the Confessio Fraternitatis, which was published the year after in 1615, continues this tradition. And then the year after that, 1616, the Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz was published, which is a kind of allegorical account of the marriage between Frederick, Elector the Palatinate, and Elizabeth, uh, um, you know, Elizabeth, daughter of, of King James. Um, and there's all sorts of allegorical stuff going on throughout all of these, uh, these three manifestos. Now, the interesting thing about this book on the Rosicrucians here, and on the documentary that I'll try to find, is that the author, Tobias Churton, tries to argue that rather than being some genuine, uh, legitimate secret society of schemers who sought to do God knows what to the world, uh, the Rosicrucians uh, were just uh, sort of truth seekers, but that the whole method by Andrei of declaring them as um, secret and creating all of this uh, kind of nefarious, uh, these kind of ne um, nefarious connotations around them uh, was a joke. Uh, it, it was just a joke on his part. And nobody got the joke. They took it. They took it seriously. But all Andre was trying to say is that there's a great deal of nonsense in the world, and that genuine truth seekers are few and far between. Um, they necessarily have to labor in obscurity. They um, keep themselves secret from the world, and so on. That's what is argued was the the real intention of the the Rosicrucian manifestos, but but that these were. Uh, misunderstood. Um, so anyway, uh, Descartes was very taken by these people, as I said. And um, now the Rosicrucians appear to have had uh, a number of explicit rules, uh, six of them in fact. One was that you wear uh, no distinctive clothing. Another one was that you administer medical services free of charge. Many Rosicrucians had, had training in medicine. Uh, in fact, one of the Im important uh, thinkers associated with, with that movement um, was a doctor. His name was Paracelsus, and he, he was this kind of combination of, of doctor and, and mystic, and this sort of weird, again, kind of blurring the line between magic and science. Um, again, it only, it only looks weird today, but that's because philosophical naturalism has sort of taken over. Back then, this was, this was more normal. Um, now, so, yeah, so the first one was wear no distinctive clothing, um, administer medical services without uh, charging a fee, agree to meet once a year, look for a worthy successor, uh, use the uh, letters RC or CR, you know, RC, Rosicrucian, 
or maybe CR the other way. Sometimes they refer to themselves as the Fratres RC, the Brothers RC. Use that as your shield. And um, also uh, keep the fraternity secret for a hundred years. This kind of thing was, was present in the manifestos, and this is what caused a lot of fear. Now, if people like Churton are right, this is all just a joke. Um, uh, but anyway, um, nevertheless, as I said, Descartes was very taken by these people and was very influenced by them. Now, there are key areas in which he diverges from their thinking. Uh, the Rosicrucians were fond of saying, for instance, that um, it is by way of a kind of inspiration that one truly discovers the secrets of nature. And although they agreed that nature was not always willing to offer up her secrets without a fight, and therefore had to be, in a sense, dissected uh, and torn apart before her secrets could be discovered, thus requiring scientific instruments. And although they even went on further to say that the book of nature was written in the language of mathematics, and so only mathematical descriptions of natural phenomena were legitimate. Although um, they believed this, and Descartes certainly agreed with them on, on this front, um, he, as I said, questioned this whole idea of a kind of mystical inspiration coming to them, and the their ability to sort of, um, I guess you could say, use the imagination to to discover the, the hidden occult truths of nature. Descartes was totally against this. He said, no, we need a certain indubitable foundation, something that everyone who, who uses reason unhindered and unencumbered by prejudice could come to understand um, something based on just good sense and sound reasoning, and therefore indubitable, correct, and therefore able to provide moorings and deal with the uh, chaotic nature of the world in which he lived. So, so that's sort of a, a description of Descartes and his connection to Rosicrucianism. Now, in this connection, there's one further thing that needs to be mentioned. I talked about how in the discourse, Descartes describes his path of, of doubt that he undertook, and he goes into more detail on that in the meditations. But he also discusses how, he also tells the story of that day of thinking, that, that, where he just sat there and thought on November 10th, 1619. Now there's another part to this story, and it's, it's something that Descartes does not reveal in the discourse or in any of his other published writings. And the reason for this is that there's a kind of Rosicrucian element to his thought as well that he's very keen to keep hidden. And the reason that he is keen to keep this hidden is because he wishes to portray himself to the world as a good Orthodox Catholic. He also wants his writings on scientific method to replace the treatises of Aristotle. He even um, tried to present his discourse to many Jesuits, for example, and tried to convince them to adopt uh, his work in their uh, teaching curriculum. Um, but there is a Rosicrucian element to his thought that he keeps hidden. And this has to do with a series of dreams that he had when he finished that day of feverish thinking on November 10th, 1619. So that night, and, and he records this, by the way, in, in a, a notebook of his, that he began writing in after he had left Beekman to go to, to Germany. He records all of this in his notebook. And there's, okay, there's a wonderful uh, book that, that Gillespie cites that I found out about from him, which talks about uh, Descartes' dreams in his notebook and the importance of it to his thought, and it's this. The Olympian Dreams and Youthful Rebellion of René Descartes by John R. Cold. Um, very interesting book. Now, there's a lot more in this book than I'm going to be able to discuss, uh, he tries to, uh, as it were, uh, psychoanalyze Descartes to try and determine some of his motivations. He even attempts to interpret uh, the, the dreams that I'm going to be describing uh, very briefly in a moment. Uh, he tries to argue that throughout his life uh, a sense of guilt had haunted Descartes because he had rejected his father's uh, original plans for him to become a magistrate and instead chose to become a philosopher. Uh, stuff like that. That's what the youthful rebellion part refers to. But on to the, on to the Olympian dreams and to his notebook. Now, you can divide the, his notebook into a few sections. Um, 
Uh, there's one section called, which he calls Parnassus, and it's just all sorts of mathematical considerations. Um, there, there's a part of it called uh, Democritica, which is just another a few lines of unfinished texts. There's some other uh, scribblings of algebra that he does. Um, uh, about a, a paragraph or about half a page where he writes on scientific method, but it's all sort of very incomplete and fragmented. On the other sides of the page, the second half of the book, so to speak, it, it, what he writes is much more coherent. Um, it, it begins to look more like a, a manuscript being prepared for publication. And there are three primary uh, sections in this uh, second part of the notebook. There's what he calls the Priambula, which, is, which runs for about four pages. What he calls the Experimenta. These are his titles, Descartes' titles. The Experimenta, uh, which runs for about five pages. And then the Olympica section, which runs for six pages, and which is dated November 11, 1620. Presumably, again, on this special date of November 10th, he had come to all of the realizations that he writes about in that Olympica section. Um, now, I mentioned that he doesn't discuss any of this in the discourse. This is because um, he, he, he doesn't want uh, certain people to know about these Rosicrucian connections. He even writes in the preambular section that um, in order to communicate my true views to the world, I must advance onto the stage as an actor masked. Um, I'm paraphrasing him. But he says more or less that. So even at the young age in which he wrote down what was in that notebook, and he was about 23 at the time, uh, he realized the need to conceal his true features, to conceal his true beliefs because of the political climate of the world that he lived in. So, um, so now in the Olympica section, he describes that after his day of feverish thinking, he had had a series of three dreams. And in these dreams he had come to realize what it was that he had to do. Um, the, the, the truths that he was seeking, the true philosophical method, the indubitable science that he was looking for, had essentially come to him by way of these dreams. Now there are some people who doubt that he really had these dreams, and they point to the fact that Descartes had Rosicrucian connections, and that within lots of Rosicrucian writings there are dream stories or allegorical tales which try to frame things as dreams, but which, which have sort of deeper underlying philosophical points to make within the story. It is using a dream narrative as a vehicle to make a philosophical point. Rosicrucians did that quite a lot, to express these kind of occult beliefs in this way. And some people suggest that Descartes may be doing the same thing, that he didn't really have these dreams. Um, be that as it may, whether they, they really happened or whether he made them up, the point is that this is important for his later development. Now, as I said, he had three dreams that night. And the first of them went like this. Um, he was walking about when an evil spirit or an evil wind assailed him and began to cause him pain. Uh, it began to push him towards a church began to force him to go into church. This evil spirit was haunting him, hurting him, and pushing him into church. Um, on the way, he had tried to stop and speak to one of his friends, but uh, the, the trouble that he was under had intensified, and he began being pushed to the church even more strongly. That was the first dream. Uh, the second dream is uh, Descartes hears a thunderclap, and he awakens. He's, he dreams that he is awakened. And he is terrified to find the air filled with sparks. And he decides to determine whether this is real or just an illusion. And he tries to do this by just blinking his eyes. And when he blinks his eyes, he finds that these sparks go away. And he determines thereby that they're not real. In the third dream, he is, uh, he is walking along a road. And he's presented with a fork in the road. And he must determine... Uh, which way he must go. And the first path, um, and this is really a kind of metaphor for the path that he should take in life, the first the first path represents humanism. And he sees uh, a copy of, of the book, um, Ars Poetarum, which is kind of a standard humanistic poetic uh, text at the time. He sees that there. 
but then the other path represents a kind of uh, Pythagorean uh, mathematical science. And one way to interpret this third dream, and I'll get to the other two in a moment, one way to interpret this third dream, and this is what Cole suggests in his book, is that um, essentially Descartes is trying to decide which path to take in life and what will provide him with the certainty and the understanding that he seeks given the chaotic world that he lives in. Uh, so when he is asleep, the humanistic path appears attractive to him, but when he awakens, he writes down, the mathematical path, the, the path of natural science appears correct. And so he chooses that. And that in itself is an interesting metaphor. When he is asleep, and only when he is asleep, that is, when he is not fully ascended to a true understanding, you might say, the humanistic path appears on a superficial level to be attractive. But when he awakens, he discovers that the, the, the path of, of mathematics and, and natural science is the superior one. So that's essentially uh, an explanation of the dreams, and I've more or less interpreted the third one already, so I'll get to the, the, the other two. Um, in the second dream, um, when he awakens to find the air filled with sparks and he blinks his eyes and sees that what he's seeing is an illusion, Descartes also says in his notebook that at that time he felt himself possessed by the spirit of truth. Now, you can see this dream as Descartes essentially saying that experiment is the way by which we discover truth about the world, because that's what he essentially does. He performs an experiment. He blinks his eyes in order to try and determine whether what he sees is real, is genuine, or is just an illusion. And he discovers that it is. This also ties within, into his uh, later philosophical work about doubting all that one uh, receives by way of the senses, because they can be illusory. Um, the first dream, where he is haunted by this evil spirit and is pushed in church, um, I believe that this evil spirit represents the nominalist God. Because the spirit is haunting him over his secret sins. And Descartes says this himself. His secret sins, sins that even he himself may not be aware of. This sounds very much like the sort of anxiety that Luther had about the nominalist God. Because remember... This God could change his moral standards at any time. One can never know whether one is giving it one's all to try and be good, and so on. There may be secret things one does not have knowledge of and cannot even understand, but this nominalist God and his great omnipotence could choose to damn one for them anyway, and so on. So, just like Luther was, Descartes seems to be worried about the, the uncertainty and the terror that the nominalist God presents, and he seems to understand that the responses to him that have been offered up to that point, namely humanism and, and Protestantism, had been insufficient, and that the religious tensions uh, engendered by Protestantism in particular that led to the, the wars of religion were a, a particularly disastrous manifestation of what that sort of uncertainty can lead to. So as I said, we can see Descartes' whole philosophical project in this light. He's looking for certainty in an uncertain world. That's fundamentally what he's doing. And he's turning to nature as, as the only option to do so, he thinks. So this evil spirit represents the nominalist god, I want to say. Um, so these dreams influenced him, and they, they really show, as I just explained, what his, his philosophical project is like. So, uh, now, having given an account of this, um, a, a few other additional details about Descartes' life. Um, in 1622, he briefly returns to Paris. Uh, he doesn't stay there long. He only stays for about three years, then he leaves to go to Italy. And the reason he leaves is because people are aware of his Rosicrucian connections and begin to suspect him of, of various nefarious things, he begins to fear for his safety, and he flees. Um, also, they began to, to grow suspicious of him because he was very private and reclusive, and so to obviate these suspicions, he began to appear in public more often. But in 1625, he, he moved to Italy, stayed there for about two, three years, and then moved to, to Holland, to Amsterdam, and he lived there. And it's in Amsterdam that he conducted most of his philosophical work. Uh, and this is because Amsterdam was, at the time, a very free and tolerant uh, uh, city, 
the, the Netherlands in general were, were very tolerant of all sorts of religious views. And Descartes, although in his published writings he tries, tries to portray himself as orthodox, it's very clear that from even his earliest days he held all sorts of unorthodox theological positions. So, um, in uh, 1628, when he arrives in the Netherlands, he, he attempts to uh, publish a manuscript which he calls The Rules for the Regulation of the Mind. And this is a sort of primitive form of the method that he lays down at last in the Discourse on Method. Um, he doesn't publish this because uh, he, he's just unsatisfied with the work. And he, he realizes that um, his original method, as he had originally conceived it, doesn't work. There are certain deeper problems that he must deal with first. And this is what uh, induces him to, to abandon the project. Now, what I mean by this is that his original, the original conception of his science was this. It was to be based on mathematics. Mathematics is, of course, certain, sorry, clad, it's indubitable, and on the basis of this certain foundation, we can provide uh, a, a solid basis for all sorts of, uh, of subsequent knowledge. Um, he realized that this wouldn't work because uh, thanks to his nominalistic philosophical training, he, he essentially accepted the, the nominalistic picture of God, and he came to realize that if God was as nominalism had asserted him to be, then God could not be bound by the eternal, so to speak, truths of mathematics. The so the um, the so-called eternal truths of mathematics were actually contingent upon God's will if the nominalist conception of him was the correct one. So that means that God could create eternal truths and therefore could uncreate them. And so one cannot base a truly certain and truly indubitable science on them because they're ultimately contingent upon the will of God. God could change them, therefore they're not certain, therefore they're not unshakable. And these me these sort of metaphysical thoughts caused him to abandon that project. Later on, this is about 1632 to 1633, uh, he attempted to publish uh, another manuscript, uh, which he simply called The World. And this was his earliest attempt to lay down his entire philosophical and scientific system. Uh, from these uh, basic... Uh, from this basic philosophical starting point, he wanted to develop a whole science where he would describe the whole of physics. He wanted to answer every conceivable problem in physics, and he wrote many letters to his friends, to people like Marin Massin, um, um, that he, he planned to answer everything that there was to answer in physics. He was very excited about this, and so on. And Marin Massin, who I mentioned, was a, a Catholic monk and a friend of Descartes who was responsible for the, the proliferation and spread of, of Descartes' work. He's an interesting character. Let me just mention him briefly. He's, he was sort of like the, the Google of the 17th century in that he knew every important intellectual figure that there was to know. He had kept up a correspondence with everyone. And so people would write to him from all around with questions. And if Mazen knew the answers to those questions, he'd answer them. And if he didn't know the answers, he would... Uh, he would direct the person writing him to someone else who would know those answers. So in a, in a way, he was, he was kind of like a 17th century Google. Uh, people went to him for all sorts of answers to all sorts of things. He's an interesting guy. But anyway, so Descartes had prepared this, this great book, The World, which he was quite proud of, but eventually decided not to publish it because uh, Galileo had been condemned. He had learned of the condemnation of Galileo and so on. Um, and he realized that he had to moderate his views and present them in a, in a, a secretive way, in a way that dis disguised his true beliefs and would therefore make what he had to say acceptable to a Catholic audience. Now, of course, in Holland, being the free country that it was, he could publish whatever he wanted and state his opinions however he wanted to state them, but he was concerned to have a political influence, so it was important to him that what he had to say would have the right sort of impact on Catholics in particular. So he had to uh, essentially portray himself as a good Catholic. Uh, he says all sorts of things in the discourse, for instance. Um, he, you know, he, he says that he, he um, served in the army on the Catholic side. I mean, he, he doesn't actually say that he, he fought in any battles, but he brings up these kind of things 
to make it appear as though he were uh, a good Catholic. Um, in fact, in the discourse, the third section of it, um, it is is very strange. It's, it's it seems completely out of place with the rest of the of the the text because. Um, in the beginning, he lays down this method where he says, I will doubt everything that there is to doubt uh, because there's so much presumption in the world. There are so many people who think they know but who really do not. And if you examine their beliefs and the underlying foundations behind them, you often find that they're faulty. And so what I must do is doubt everything which can be doubted until I can find something which cannot be doubted. And I must not rely on, on custom or tradition or anything like this, because these things can be mistaken. But in the third section, he discusses morality briefly, and he says that he'd sort of cobbled together a moral code for himself, and this moral code essentially amounted to following the rules in whatever country he happened to be present at the time. Uh, this is, you know, very bizarre, and goes against the rest of his argument, and once you see this, you can, you can start to see that in some areas within the discourse, in particular, Descartes is being rather disingenuous. He's trying to portray himself as something that he's not, but he's not being so secretive about it that an intelligent reader would not be able to uh, discern it. He's trying to hide himself, but not too much, because he wants certain people to know what his true beliefs are, the, the truly intelligent, so to speak. He's writing what he's writing in, in an occult matter, in the literal sense of the term, that there's an, uh, an exoteric meaning to what he says, and then there's that deeper esoteric meaning. And you see this also in Rosicrucian writings. This is a further example of Rosicrucian influence on Descartes. Um, so, so he tries to portray himself as a good Catholic despite his heterodox uh, views. And there's another interesting thing that he does. Um, in the discourse, he says something to the effect that um, there are no works of art uh, which have been composed by many artists working together which are as fine or as excellent as works of art composed by a single mind. There are no uh, buildings which have been built by many architects working together um, and contributing pieces to the building over time as there are uh, buildings which are the product of a single mind. And now, he, he's saying this because in the world around him, he sees, number one, uh, religious conflicts of all sorts, where uh, people are just asserting different uh, religious doctrines presumptuously and then fighting about them. Um, he, he, is, um, he was, when he originally conducted his, his first thoughts on this topic, living in a haphazard, unplanned village, and now he's living in Amsterdam, which is the finest, most tolerant, most well-built uh, you know, city of the time. And he's trying to contrast what would happen and what the world would be like if people uh, followed a consistent methodology and were rational, where, as opposed to what it would be like and what it is like, he would think, if they just sort of did things in a haphazard manner. So he's, he wants to say that method is necessary, consistent application of, of rational intelligence is necessary, otherwise we have chaos. And he gives other examples too. Uh, he doesn't just talk about buildings or cities, he also talks about laws. He gives the example of uh, uh, people who sort of naturally, organically grew up together out of a primitive state and uh, developed a haphazard law of precedent, and he compares that to the Spartans, who had a, a lawgiver originally, a great lawgiver, at least allegedly, named Lycurgus, who laid down the original Spartan law. He then compares uh, man-made religions and the chaos that they engender versus uh, religions as set down by God, and so on. Now, the purpose of these distinctions is actually to distinguish uh, himself, Descartes, from Aristotle, because Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics, which is one of his works, uh, makes a similar sort of division. Um, Aristotle, when he talks about knowledge, makes a distinction between practical and theoretical knowledge. Um, he says that practical knowledge uh, is also divided into two further subcategories. Um, that is, that which relates to uh, things made, which he calls techne, uh, 
and then things done, phronesis. And he says that practical knowledge, whether techne or phronesis, cannot intersect with theoretical knowledge, which is really just concerned with first principles. So in theoretical knowledge, you have first principles, and you, you deduce things from those first principles. Um, practical knowledge, according to Aristotle, is concerned with things that change, and theoretical knowledge, which things that, uh, concerned with things that don't change, eternal things, so on. Now, Descartes uh, sets himself up in a similar way, but he does this to distinguish himself from Aristotle. He wants to say that the distinction between practical and theoretical knowledge that Aristotle posits isn't a real distinction, and that if one correctly applies his method and reconstructs the sci his science in the way that he says that it should be reconstructed from absolute first principles, he can use this theoretical knowledge to make practical um, applications and to have practical effects in the world. Uh, and the ultimate aim of this is to improve the human lot, to essentially conquer nature. And this is where naturalism comes in. That is, you use scientific study of the natural world and gain knowledge about nature and then use that knowledge for human ends to improve the human lot, to extend our lives, to make us wealthier, and what have you. This is all a product of that kind of naturalistic thinking and Descartes is paradigmatic of that. Uh, this again ties into his uh, connections to Rosicrucianism because the purpose of what the Rosicrucians were doing was they weren't gathering knowledge for their own personal aggrandizement. They were using it to try and, and benefit humanity as they saw it. That's why they had the rule where they had to administer medical care without ever charging a fee. The purpose of the knowledge that they sought was to benefit humanity as a whole. That's also what Descartes wanted to do. Now, he discusses, as I said, the example of buildings made by many architects working together, uh, uh, villages and cities that arise in a haphazard hodgepodge manner versus those that are planned, um, and, and all those sorts of distinctions. Now, in this, one sees in Descartes also, and this is a connection to, to more contemporary ideas, not only philosophical naturalism and the idea that scientific knowledge of nature must be used for the benefit of humankind, but also this idea of a technocratic intellectual. Right? Because Descartes is saying that one man who applies uh, reasoning and methodology and science properly can spin out the implications of science all on his own. That is, we don't need a science or something masquerading as a science, which is really just the conflicting interests of many different people. One man, provided that he does things correctly and uses good sense, can do this on his own. Um, now, this is interesting because if you actually examine how real legal systems work, they do tend to emerge in that sort of uh, haphazard way based on precedent that Descartes derides. But those legal systems are more flexible, they're more adaptable, they're more suitable to the native culture in which they emerge. And those can be contrasted with the uh, sort of state-mandated positivistic legal systems uh, which which often rise run into all sorts of uh, you know administrative troubles and inefficiencies. They don't work very well. They're subject to all sorts of corruption. Uh, furthermore, just to go against Descartes' example of Lycurgus, Lycurgus uh, probably didn't exist. I mean, there's a there's a good chance that he's a mythical figure, and therefore that Spartan law emerged not by being promulgated by one single lawgiver from a central location, but in in the kind of uh, you know haphazard way of, of precedent that he thinks is so terrible. Um, also, uh, if you look at how science is actually done, it's done by way of you know, a community of scholars doing experiments, recording their results, and submitting them to exam the examination of other scientists. It's a communal activity. It's not done by one person. Right? So um, there's, there seems to be that, that weird kind of element to it, but you can certainly see the idea of the technocratic intellectual emerging out of Descartes' thought, or at least the implications of that. Um, now, having discussed that, let's go into the meditations on first philosophy. Now, I, I showed this briefly, but I just want to display it again. It's very important that we consider not only the meditations, but the objections and replies.
And Descartes says this himself. He says this, they have to be read together because um, when he originally published the meditations, he asked Merzen uh, to send his manuscript to a few uh, thinkers, uh, people like Antoine Arnaud, Pierre Gassendi, with whom he had a quite famous debate, uh, Thomas Hobbes, and so on. And he wanted to get their objections and then respond to their objections, and by way of responding to their objections, to refine his ideas. And he ultimately decided to, to publish everything uh, at once. Now, um, in discussing this, now we're going to get really deep into uh, Descartes' actual philosophical views. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, he had this path of doubt, where you doubt everything that is dubitable to find that which can no longer be doubted. He hints at this only very briefly in the discourse. And so the reason that he wrote the meditations was to answer questions that had arisen about the discourse. The discourse on method had originally been published when it was published in 1637 in French. It was intended for a popular audience. And he even says that he will not describe his full thoughts on these matters, on this path of doubt, because he fears that they may be too metaphysical for a popular audience. But when he publishes the meditations in 1640, he finally does this. So, um, to get into the meditations. It's, it's, uh, the meditations, the, the work itself is split up into a series of six meditations where he goes through uh, a series of thoughts. I won't be discussing everything in detail, but just certain parts that are, that are important. Now, an underlying theme that I want to hint at and suggest as I go through this discussion is that the, the source of doubt for Descartes, the source of that great metaphysical doubt that he wants to overcome by way of his philosophy, is the nominalist God. And indeed, the, the famous Cartesian demon, or the evil genius that in, his, in Descartes' thought experiment and meditations systematically deceives him about everything, I want to suggest that what he really has in mind when he thinks of that is this omnipotent nominalist God who could uh, either compose nature in such a way that we are systematically deceived or compose our minds in such a way that we systematically misperceive nature or even intervene in an ad hoc manner to systematically deceive us. Um, in, in other words, w with nominalism, the idea of a kind of rational order as structured by universals was gone. And so everything could now be doubted. The certain foundations had been eliminated, and the point of Descartes' philosophical project was to try and, and restore this by way of um, indubitable principles, which then led to a mathematical science, and, and so on. And that science was founded on the, the exploitation of nature, which would then lead to the improvement of the human lot. That, in a nutshell, is Descartes' project. So, with this underlying idea of what his project is, and of the shadow of the nominalist god sort of sitting over the whole thing, let's go into Descartes' ideas finally. Okay, so, um, in the first meditation, he essentially uh, recounts what he had described uh, in the, uh, the, 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 the discourse. Right? So, he talks about, uh, you know, doubting everything that, they, that could be doubted, and eventually you know, he says he doubts everything that he sees, every thought that enters his mind, every sensual perception that he has, um, all of his memories, all of the results of his reasonings. He essentially wills the world away by a stupendous Herculean effort of doubt, and he begins to worry that he has destroyed everything, and says, does it then follow that I do not exist? But, of course, he goes on to say that... Um, he does exist, that in doubting he realizes that he is one who is doubting, and therefore in trying to doubt his own existence, he affirms it by way of the act of doubt. He shows that he must exist because he's there doubting. And therefore, you know, he reaches his famous fundamental principle, I think, therefore I am, which Descartes believes is indubitable. Now, there are a few misconceptions about this principle that, that have to be uh, dealt with. Now, I, I've mentioned in previous videos very briefly, and I'm going to emphasize this again and, and really pause to talk about it for a minute because it's important, that St. Augustine had also centuries earlier made the same argument that Descartes had when Augustine had set about to argue against philosophical skeptics. 
he said that one cannot rationally doubt one's own existence. And he says this in his uh, one of his works against the academicians, which you see here. Um, in fact, one of those who were commenting on Descartes' meditations, Blaise Pascal, who was a, a great admirer of Augustine because he was a, a Jansenist, and Jansenism was essentially a revival of Augustinian theology and anthropology, um, Descartes, uh, Pascal, I'm sorry, uh, de derides Descartes for making this argument because he says, uh, he says something to the, fa to the effect of, we owe a great deal to Mr. Descartes because without him, we would not know what Augustine had already established centuries ago. You know, in, in other words, thank you for plagiarizing Augustine, you know, Mr. Descartes. Um, but, but there is a fundamental difference between Augustine's way of asserting the principle that one cannot doubt one's own existence and Descartes' way of doing it. For Augustine, the fact that one exists is an external fact. That is to say, it is something out there. It is independent of one's thinking it. It's something that is true whether one thinks it or not. For Descartes, on the other hand, the act of thinking the fundamental principle that because one thinks one cannot, one exists, one exists, and therefore that one must exist, the act of thinking that must, must be, um, make it true. That is, the fundamental principle's truth lies not in the fact that it describes some fact about the world, but in its performance. The fact that you think it is what makes it true. And when you go deeper into Descartes' work, you realize that he believes that we are always implicitly thinking the fundamental principle whenever we think of anything else, whenever we have any other thought about anything else, because that's what underlies everything else. So what Descartes is saying here, and this is very important to understand, is that in thinking the fundamental principle, you make it true. The self, therefore, becomes self-grounding, self-positing, self-creating even. That is, by thinking the thought that you exist, you establish yourself in existence. You make it the case that you exist. Um, this, is, this is very important. This is, this is going to become extremely important when I discuss uh, in a minute Descartes' ideas about God. Now there's a few other things that have to be talked about. For, most importantly, uh, what does Descartes mean by thinking? What is thinking for Descartes? Well, uh, the ancient sort of pre-modern conception of rationality had it that it was a faculty uh, distinct from the will. Okay, So if, if one perceives something by reason, it's not an act of will that one perceives it. You can't really choose not to understand that one plus one is two, for example. It's just rationally obvious and irresistible. Um, and this led to the ancient conception of, of, of uh, freedom as being, um, as being directed by reason. That is, the ancient conception of freedom was that one is free if one behaves rationally, if one lives according to reason, and if one does not, one instead submits to irrational desires of all sorts and is uh, led astray by all sorts of irrational impulses, one is to that extent enslaved. Uh, Descartes rejects this. For Descartes, uh, thinking is not like this at all. Uh, in fact, thinking is, is an active faculty. In his mature thought especially, it becomes an act of the will. Reason, to reason is to will. Reason and will, which in ancient thought were held distinct, are blended together and become one and the same thing in Descartes. Okay, so in his early thought, um, Descartes had a problem to deal with. And the problem was this. Uh, there are these pure innate ideas, these, these mathematical objects, for example. That would be one example of these innate ideas, which are just obvious to the intuition. And then there are the, the, the facts of sensory experience. They're the things that we see in the world, and so on. And in order to make judgments of truth and falsity, we have to compare what it is we see and perceive in the world to these eternal, uh, perfect 
abstract forms which are um, present in the intuition. The trouble is, how do we bring what we see in, in the senses together with these objects of the intuition? Now, the answer that Descartes gave in his early thought was the imagination. That is, uh, the intuition has these uh, innate ideas. Um, they are given figural representation in the imagination. When one and also when one perceives things by the senses, one can take what one perceives, um, abstract it into a kind of uh, mathematical representation, a kind of mathematical form, bring that to uh, the imagination, and then compare those fundamental innate ideas to one's representation of what one perceives by way of the senses. And when one compares them to see if they are alike or not, that is what the act of judgment fundamentally is. Now, in his late thought, I'm sorry about the phone, uh, nothing I can do about it. Um, now, it is, in his later thought, reason begins to take more and more of a back seat, and will becomes primary. So when Descartes describes perception, for example, he describes it in, in, in the following way, that will stimulates the brain. The brain then creates this world of sense, sense experience around us. And that's perception, that these images are formed by the brain as an end to understanding, but that it's will that ultimately stimulates this whole process. And so perception becomes an act of will. Um, then, rather than the innate ideas being simply present in the intuition, as they were in his original thought, the will actually summons them up in his later thought. And so um, thinking, that is, summoning up these kind of eternal truths and eternal principles becomes an act of will. Perception becomes an act of will. And then the act of comparing them, which is judgment, that too is an act of will. And so thought, rationality in a fundamental sense, becomes an act of will for Descartes. Reason and will are no longer distinct faculties. To reason is to will. Okay? That's very important to understand. Now, with this in mind, um, we have the further problem. See, Descartes was able to establish his own existence, but what he ultimately wants to do is provide a sure, secure foundation for science. And if the only thing that you can establish is that you exist, if you can't establish that mathematics can give us truths, if you can't establish that there are physical objects which can be analyzed and so on, if you can't establish anything like that, you can't do science. So to simply know that he exists is not enough for him to complete his scientific project. He needs more. Um, so he has to deal with this problem of the deceiver God, right? the nominalistic God which in his infinite will might be using his infinite power to systematically deceive him. He has to deal with this nominalistic God. In a fundamental sense, he has to tame this God. He has to sweep away the doubts that he engenders and thereby establish certainty. How does he do this? How does Descartes tame this nominalistic God? Well, he does this by way of his, his famous ontological argument. Now, I mentioned this whole idea of an exoteric uh, interpretation of Descartes and an esoteric interpretation, and this comes up yet again. Now, the traditional way of reading Descartes' ontological argument, what you might call the exoteric interpretation, goes like this. Um, I have in my mind this idea of perfection. I can conceive of what perfection is, right? but because I am limited, because I am finite, and I know that I am limited and finite because there are all sorts of things, all sorts of ideas in my mind that are open to doubt, and therefore that brings up in me the, the knowledge of the fact that I do not have perfect knowledge of things, that my all that I think I know is open to doubt, other than my own existence, but all of these other things that I know are open to doubt. Therefore, that establishes that I am finite. But if I have this idea of perfection in my mind, and I am finite, then this idea of perfection cannot come from me. However, because this idea is there, it must come from somewhere, and that somewhere is God. Therefore, God exists, and he is perfect. But because God is perfect, and because deception, 
implies a kind of moral evil and is indicative of some kind of imperfection or lack. God, therefore, cannot be a deceiver. So, even if my perceptions are not um, accurate and depict the, the true world underlying the phenomena in a sense that a naive realist might believe in, a naive realism is just the view that, that whatever you perceive is really the way the world is. Almost no philosophers are, are naive realists in that sense. But even if my perceptions are not true, what I perceive must still be such as would allow me to get to the ultimate truth. That is, even if my immediate naive perceptions don't give me truth, God, because he is not a deceiver, must have given me such faculties as to make it possible to get at the truth. And also, because God is not a deceiver, the truths of mathematics are, are sound. They're contingent on his will in that God could uncreate them, but he won't because he's perfect and he wants us to have knowledge and so on. So therefore, mathematics is certain, physics can be done, and um, science is established. Okay, so that's the exoteric interpretation of Descartes' ontological argument. There are some problems with this interpretation. though. For example, um, in the third meditation, in the meditations, Descartes refers to God as infinite. In the fifth meditation, uh, he refers to him as a perfect being. But in the first and fourth replies to the objections, he refers to God as a causa sui, that is, the, as the cause of himself. Now, why is this a problem? Well, um, if Descartes is infinite, uh, I'm sorry, if God is infinite, sorry about that, God is infinite, as he's said to be in one of the places, then he must, in a sense, be beyond reason. If he is beyond reason, then he can be a deceiver. But if he is perfect, he cannot be a deceiver. Um, furthermore, if he is a causa sui, then, you know, in some sense he is restricted by laws of causality and therefore cannot be infinite. So these three descriptions seem on the surface, if we take this surface interpretation of Descartes' ontological argument, uh, to, to be contradictory. And they suggest that there is a deeper esoteric interpretation of the argument, which shows that Descartes probably had a, a deeper and more uh, heterodox understanding of what God was. And I think that, that that's the case. Um, so let's go into that. Okay, um, in, in medieval metaphysics, and you see this especially um, in, in the thought of Thomas Aquinas, it was always insisted that God could not be directly understood. Aquinas and, and others, but especially Aquinas, went to great pains to say that we cannot directly speak of God. Anyone who attempts to directly speak of what God is or to claim to know what God fundamentally is, is talking nonsense. When we speak of God, we have to speak of him indirectly. We have to take finite things and, as it were, negate them. We say, okay, the following things in the world are finite. God is not like this. And that gives us an idea of what God is not like. And so we have this kind of negative conception of God, a way of approaching God's nature indirectly. Okay? Um, if, for anyone who's interested, of, who's interested in what Aquinas believed about God, there's an excellent talk that I found by Brian Davies where he talks about Aquinas' idea of God. Um, if you're interested in that, I'll get a link to it and you can watch it. But the point is that we have to, in, in Aquinas' thought and in pre-modern medieval thought, the idea was always that we had to reason about God indirectly, that we had to make use of analogies, that we cannot directly perceive or understand the infinite, and so we can't speak of it indirectly. We have no direct positive idea of God. We always have to approach it in a negative way. Descartes, and this may be because of his mathematical work, this may come about as a result of his mathematical training and his interest in mathematics. Descartes rejected this utterly. Um, he insisted, no, in fact, we do have a positive idea of God. And we do have a positive idea of infinity. And what he tried to do was to, to kind of give a, geomet to give a geometrical analogy. It went something like this. Now, you have a geometrical plane, right? Two-dimensional plane, R2, let's say, or 
or or or n, you know, whatever. But we'll, let's just focus on two dimensions because it's simpler. You can extend the plane out infinitely. It's of infinite size, and you can draw or inscribe figures on this plane, and these figures are bounded and finite. Now, we do understand what an infinite plane is. We we understand this meta, this mathematical concept. Now, what Descartes wants to say is that the, uh, God is analogous to this, except that instead of being infinite in just one respect, like the concept of the mathematical plane is, God is infinite in every respect. But because we have a positive idea of an infinite mathematical plane, and because we understand that any finite figures that we inscribe on the plane are, in a sense, negations of this infinite plane, you then come to the conclusion that the finite is the negation of the infinite, and that the infinite is primary in our understanding, and that the finite, the finite is the negation of it. The pre-modern conception that we saw in Aquinas, remember, was the exact opposite of this. First you have the finite, and then you prescind from the finite. You think of what the finite is not, and then you indirectly approach God that way. For Descartes, it's the opposite. Um, the infinite is primary, and the finite is the negation of that. So he insists that we have an innate idea of God, an innate idea of perfection. And this is essential for his ontological argument. This all comes out in that. Now, why is this important? Okay. I want to suggest as a final idea in the discussion of Descartes' thought that Descartes' ultimate project was to tame the nominalist God, to get rid of the uncertainty that he engendered, and in a sense to take his kingdom away from him, his kingdom being nature. That is, the purpose of science is to bring nature under man's dominion, to take it away from God, to limit the power of God, to uh, stifle the doubts that he engenders, to limit his power, to in a sense conquer God, to almost, so to speak, destroy God. That may be a bit of a strong word, but really, fundamentally, what it comes down to in the end, Descartes would have never said this, um, perhaps because he didn't see this implication, uh, or, or what have you, or perhaps he was just trying to keep these kind of more hermetic, uh, mystical views uh, that he had secret. But the ultimate purpose was to destroy God, to take his place on the throne of the cosmos, and uh, thereby to, to ascend to, to divinity, in a sense, by progressively improving the human lot and eventually becoming godlike. And so, in that sense, you can almost see Descartes as being the first transhumanist, in a way. I mean, he, transhumanism derives from his thought. Okay, so that's another connection to contemporary ideas. That's that's something very interesting and fascinating that you you get when you you probe into Descartes' ideas deeply. So now, why does this come out? Well, that requires a bit more explanation because, as I said, Descartes rejected the pre-modern conception of God and understanding of God as coming indirectly and thought instead that we have a, a direct, positive idea of God. Um, he goes on to say that because I am finite, I, you know, my, myself, a human person, because I am finite, I am able to perceive that I am not perfect, I, that I lack certain knowledge of, of various things, and therefore that I am not God. I am able to distinguish myself from God. God, however, because he is perfect, does not come to any sort of realization of his own finitude. Uh, he's perfect, and so his knowledge is not limited. He doesn't come to a realization of his own finitude. And because he doesn't come to a realization of his own finitude, he is not able to distinguish himself from anything else. And so um, Descartes' conception of God has this fascinating, um, insane, backwards kind of implication that if you demonstrate God's existence in the way that Descartes attempts to demonstrate it through his ontological argument, you actually also wind up demonstrating God's impotence. Okay, Because in a sense, he, 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 he's very limited in, in how he can act in this world. And in that way, uh, the nominalist God and his terrifying power is tamed. Now, there's something else to understand now, furthermore. Um, as I said, for Descartes, thinking is an act of will. 
And perception is an act of will. All mental faculties are fundamentally acts of will. Now, what Descartes also asserts in one of the meditations, I believe that this is the fourth one, although I, I could be wrong, um, he asserts that our will is just like the will of God. That is, it is infinite. We are alike with God in that sense. That can be said to be the image of God in us. We have this in common with God, that both of our wills are infinite. And he says this because, for Descartes, the will is fundamentally a faculty of being able to choose one alternative or another. And you either choose one alternative or the other. It's either yes or no. It's either one or zero. It's, it's binary. And so that's the only way in which a will can be. And so, just as God has a will, the will, because of what a will is by nature, must be that faculty of choosing between alternatives. And because we have a will, our will must be the same. So our will is the same as God. Now, the reason that we have not yet ascended to God-like power, the reason that we haven't uh, been able to challenge God, is because God's knowledge is unlimited, and it's infinite, and ours is not. However, by the progressive development of science, we could increase um, human knowledge, push back the frontier of the limits of our understanding, and therefore uh, attain progressively higher and higher, uh, you know, and greater status, and as, as I said, eventually ascend to uh, divinity, to, to, to becoming godlike. We then, Descartes wouldn't use this term, but what this eventually comes down to is transhumanism. It's the idea of making humans into something beyond the human and into something ultimately godlike. So, in, in, in that sense, by increasing our knowledge, we can, we can dethrone God. But also, because perception is an act of will, and because our own existence is undergirded by our implicitly thinking the fundamental principle at every moment when we think everything else, because the fundamental principle is a condition of thinking, is a, is a necessary condition for thinking, the world then becomes representation, which is to say that that which we perceive, our perceptions of the world, our experience, our mental experience, is a representation. It may not be what the world is ultimately like under the phenomena, but when we, when we perceive physical things, physical objects like this book, we see that it is extended. It's extended in space, and therefore it can be modeled mathematically and analyzed mathematically. So humans essentially, through representation and through their mental faculties, will this world of representation into existence, and so, to borrow a phrase from Schopenhauer, which he uses differently, but which is connected to this, I want to argue. I mean, there, there are definitely threads connecting these things. The world becomes a, a representation. It becomes something created by the human will. And that's another way in which, we can, in which man can dethrone and displace God. Man, through his faculty of representation, wills the world as representation into being, creates the world, and therefore dethrones God. Now, as I said, I mean, if, if you sat down with Descartes and you asked him, do you really believe this, I doubt he would say it. But the point is that this is where uh, the implications of Descartes' own thinking lead. This is what happens when you, when you look at uh, reasoning and all sorts of other mental faculties like perception as fundamentally being acts of will, and it's also what happens when you come to think of God in this positive rather than the, the traditional negative way that you see in uh, medieval metaphysics. So that's essentially Descartes' plan, to construct, construct a science on a certain foundation that would lead to the proliferation of good sense, of the continual improvement of the human lot through the development of science, the expansion of our knowledge, the pushing back of the frontiers of our ignorance, and therefore, by that token, the elimination and the taming of the nominalist God and the uncertainties that he engenders. Now, Descartes also, uh, although he didn't write this, and he went to great pains to avoid having to say this, in fact, in fact he denies this in, in the discourse, but there's some reason to think that he's being disingenuous. Uh, this whole program of his has great um, political implications as well. Because tradition cannot be trusted, because we must reason from first principles, right? 
Um, therefore, all of the emerged uh, social and political structures, which came about naturally, have to be overturned. We have to replace them with something that is the product of good sense, as Descartes understands it. And this, of course, has revolutionary implications. Now, when you combine this together with the fact that um, Descartes believes man's knowledge, at least currently, to be limited, but his will to be unlimited, you have this idea of man as this, unli as this uh, unlimited willing being, always striving for more, but therefore, but always also being uh, limited and frustrated by the limitations of the world and the limitations of his knowledge. So you produce this kind of utopian tendency for infinity, because man is fundamentally, like God, infinite will, but, there, but also uh, a frustrated tendency because of the limitations of the world. So you have this utopian striving, and you have this notion of this kind of utopian romantic uh, striving coming out of Descartes' thought, and also implicit in it, which then leads to more uh, utopian uh, movements like, like communism, for example, which sought to create a new man, which sought to refashion human nature, uh, which sought to use what they took to be science to achieve that end. Um, so, and, and also, you, you see it also with fascism, um, with uh, movements like National Socialism, which essentially sought to uh, conceive of politics as being fundamentally something um, willful. That is, anything which one wants to achieve politically, one can achieve if one simply has enough will to do it. There are no fundamental uh, laws or structures of, of of nature that would limit this. There are no, for example, laws of economics that would stand in the way of allowing a uh, certain government policy to ever be successful. Uh, Mises, in fact, uh, he goes into great detail of, of this kind of problem and this implication within uh, fascist and national socialist thinking in one of his books uh, called The Epistemological Problems of Economics. He doesn't connect it to Descartes, though. I'm doing that. Uh, I want to say that all of these kind of utopian political ideologies connect to Descartes' thought, because he, he conceives of man fundamentally as a thinking thing. Remember, in Descartes' conception, you are not, you are not your physical body. You are not ultimately uh, within the, the mechanical world of physics. You are, you are fundamentally incorporeal. You are intellectual substance. And so you are different from this world and in a sense can transcend it. You also have an infinite will, and that leads to these utopian strivings. So you have all of that, you have this kind of transhumanist element, you have this notion of a technocratic intellectual using good sense and establishing reason and doing away with, with tradition and precedent and so on, and, and sort of emergent uh, structures of authority that, that kind of emerged through a, you know, the process of living in society. All of this is being swept away, and this is revolutionary implications. Now Descartes denies this in the discourse. He says that custom has gone far enough and, and worked well enough to make the current political institutions palatable. But of course, it's obvious that he's being disingenuous here, because the argument that custom has made political institutions palatable goes against the rest of his argument that says that you know, custom just produces presumption. So there's this obvious contradiction there, and on the surface it might seem like he wants to distance himself from revolutionary implications, but the esoteric interpretation of what he's saying is that, that he indeed does want these sort of revolutionary changes to happen. He also goes on to assert throughout the discourse that he's only seeking to reform uh, his own thoughts and put his own knowledge in order. But if that were true, well, then what would be the point of publishing his work, right? He could just, he could just sit there and think and do it himself, right? Um, of course, the reason that he wanted to, to uh, publish his work is that he wanted to create revolutionary changes in society. For one thing, he tried often to talk to many different uh, Jesuits, try to get them to accept the discourse and to use it in their schools to teach students rather than Aristotle. So he wanted to influence education and therefore the, the formation of people's attitudes and by extension uh, the, the culture, the, the climate of the world, uh, so the, the, the intellectual cultural climate of things, the zeitgeist. Um, and it's also in, it's also uh, an implication of Descartes' fundamental principle that one has to undergo the process of doubt oneself and think it in order to see its truth. So everyone has to individually follow the path that Descartes outlines in the, in the meditations in more detail. Because remember, 
the fundamental principle is such that when you think it, you make it true. It's not true independently of its being thought. Its truth lies in its performance. So everyone has to uh, read Cartesian science, learn about Cartesian first principles, establish Cartesian science for himself, and, and, and from that foundation, everything else can proceed. This uh, representational reconstruction of the world, um, this representation being a product of human will, um, God as infinite substance, therefore kind of not being able to distinguish himself from other things, and therefore being limited, but also not being a deceiver, thus making science possible, thus making the conquest of nature for human purposes, and the uh, removal of it from God's control, and therefore essentially the, the conquest and subjugation of God himself, possible. So, what I want to end this discussion of Descartes' thought on is to understand that the modern project, modern philosophy, modern thought, as conceived of by Descartes, was in its fundamental sense an effort to, to destroy God. No, to destroy the nominalist God, not the, the rationalistic God of scholasticism, but the nominalist God, but still a project to destroy God and to put man in his place, to, to elevate man, to create man into a divinity. Now, not to be hyperbolic here, but, um, I mean, that's by definition, it seems to be, at least if you take a certain definition of the term I'm going to use, that seems by definition to be a satanic project. Because, if, you know, take Levian Satanism, for example, it's really self-worship. It's treating yourself as a deity. That's what Descartes is doing. He's taking the self and elevating it to godlike status. It's a fundamentally satanic, literally satanic project in, in that sense, in which one seeks to replace God with man. But of course, when man replaces God with himself, you know, he, he slowly goes mad. The finite becomes the measure of all things. And, you know, nihilism pretty clearly follows. Now, what I will go on to argue in further videos is that nihilism as a whole follows from uh, the nominalist God and the picture of him of God established by nominalism. And you can already see this because uh, just, just think of the nominalist God as the Cartesian evil demon, as the Cartesian deceiver, the one who engenders all these doubts. If everything is dubitable and nothing is certain, that's what you have. You have, nominal, you have, you have nihilism. Um, so, but the whole point of the modern project was to put man in God's place. And this opened the door for all sorts of totalitarianism, all sorts of degeneracy and, and moral decline, because man became the ultimate standard of all things, right? It's, it's all, it's all a pro morality is all a product of human will. Do whatever you want, right? That, that's what it fundamentally comes down to. Right, so I, th I think I've made that point clear. Um, so yes, modernity is a fundamentally satanic project. Now, ending on that, let's begin the discussion of the mind-body problem that I wanted to, to, to go into. And to contrast modern uh, thought, especially its Cartesian inclination, but also uh, naturalism, with uh, a pre-modern uh, conception of philosophy of mind, as we see in hylomorphism. Now, this discussion is not going to be as detailed as it can be. Um, I actually have a book on hylomorphism that's coming in the mail right now as we speak. Um, it's called uh, The Structure and Metaphysics of Mind, by William Jaworski. I'll, I'll put a link to it below, as I do for all the books that I've shown in this video. Um, uh, so, uh, now, remember, Descartes, let, let's start with Descartes. Uh, Descartes said fundamentally that man is a thinking thing, okay? because you establish your own existence by thinking the fundamental principle. You cannot doubt your own existence. So you are a thinking incorporeal in substance. But you also have a body, clearly, right? So, there comes this problem of how is it that this incorporeal uh, mental substance, which does not exist anywhere in space, can interact with this uh, object, this physical object called the, the, the human body, which clearly does exist in space. How does this interaction occur? If you have these two fundamentally distinct substances, how do they interact with each other? That's, that's fundamentally the mind-body problem. Um, it's, it's very difficult for a Cartesian dualist uh, to answer this. Um, now, th there are motivations to be 
a dualist. I mean, some people in the wake of seeing this problem become outright physicalists. Uh, there, there are problems with physicalism. I don't want to make this a video about physicalism, but I think that the only consistent uh, approach to philosophy of mind that one can take within a physicalist perspective is eliminativism, which essentially eliminates all mental phenomena and leads to the idea that there are no such things as ideas. There are no such things as beliefs. That I'm not really using meaningful words right now and using language to convey ideas to you and that you're not really understanding what I'm saying. That's all nonsense, of course. Um, I'm not going to try and demonstrate in this video that that's what it leads to. That's just what I believe. Uh, I may do that in a future video. I don't want to take up the time to do that. But um, there are people who turn to physicalism in the wake of seeing this problem, this interaction problem for Cartesian uh, dualists. Now, um, but there are ways to, to try and explain various other problems. Take the problem of personal identity. Um, let's say you meet your friend one day, you have a conversation with him, and then you go your separate ways, and you meet again the next day. How do you know that this is the same person? Now, if you're a Cartesian dualist, this is a big problem, because um, what's going on with a human is that an incorporeal mental substance is interacting with a human body. Now, how do you know that the same incorporeal substance that interacted with your friend's body yesterday is the one that's interacting with it today? Maybe it's a different substance. How would you know? And that would mean that your friend is an entirely different person than the person he was yesterday. And, and you can't tell if a different incorporeal substance is interacting with your friend's body from an examination of the physical characteristics of your friend because you know, he's displaying all the same physical characteristics. He has all the same uh, bodily movements. He looks the same, and so on. Um, you also can't appeal to psychological characteristics like memories or beliefs or, or opinions or, or anything like that. No, nothing mental. Because these mental characteristics could have just jumped, theoretically, onto another incorporeal substance. So you can't appeal to uh, physical continuity. You can't say that person A is the same as person B if person A is physically continuous with person B, because it's possible for two people to be physically continuous and yet have different incorporeal substances interacting with them, thus making them different people on the Cartesian conception. And you can't posit psychological continuity, that is, one will have the same memories, the same beliefs, the same thoughts. You can't say that, because that's also compatible with there being two different incorporeal substances interacting with the same uh, psychologically continuous uh, you know, person. Um, so if that's possible, uh, that threatens to uh, undermine the, the coherence of the very idea of an incorporeal substance. If you can't tell when an incorporeal substance is interacting with a person based on uh, physical continuity, and you can't do it based on psychological continuity, then there's no way you can tell. Um, and it, again, it just undermines the whole coherence of the Cartesian idea of, uh, of an immaterial uh, substance. Um, you also have the problem of other minds. Remember, all Descartes was able to demonstrate was that he exists. That doesn't follow that anyone else exists. Maybe these other people are just zombies, and they're displaying the characteristics of persons, but there's really no incorporeal substance interacting with their body, somehow. That it's, just, it's just mechanistic bodily movements going on, and they just happen to produce things that just by chance happen to look like uh, physical interactions, like conversations, that, that, that makes it look like they understand what you're saying, but they really don't. Um, you know, this is all this is all logically possible, right? So you have this problem of other minds that emerges on the Cartesian view. So you have this, you have problems of personal identity, you have the interaction problem, and you have the problem of other minds, and they all emerge as a result of. Descartes' idea of this incorporeal substance, and so it's very difficult to make sense of dualism on this way. Now, there are other philosophers who've said, well, um, maybe you can say, this is regarding the problem of personal identity, maybe you can say that person A is the same as person B if there's a certain correctly specified combination of physical and psychological continuity. But if you do this, and this is something that's been pointed out by the philosopher Derek Parfit, um, if you do this, then you've essentially eliminated any robust con concept of the, the person. There's no robust concept of personhood anymore. It's just psychological and physical properties. That's all we are, psychological and physical properties. There's no, like, separate substance that is the person. So, 
Uh, and this has actually led uh, Parfit to believe that persons do not exist. Now, I, I don't share this view. But the point is that if you take these kind of modernist Cartesian assumptions seriously, it makes sense that you'd come to this view. Now, why is that? Because Descartes fundamentally divides the world into incorporeal mental substance and then uh, physical objects. And all physical objects obey the laws of physics and material causality. Right? So, so material substance, therefore, on the Cartesian conception, is pure material. It doesn't have any kind of fundamental mental component to it. This is one reason why I argue that if you take uh, that kind of modernist Cartesian uh, concept of matter seriously, and then you're a materialist in philosophy of mind, you have to be an eliminativist. All mental, uh, all pro all mental properties get eliminated. So, so, so because Descartes makes this division between uh, incorporeal mental substance and physical objects that obey the laws of, of physics and, and kind of efficient causality and so on. And because of his nominalist philosophical training where he rejects universals, he cannot accept the answer to the problems of, uh, to the problems of uh, personal identity and uh, to interaction and these other problems in philosophy of mind that were originally offered by pre-modern philosophers like Thomas Aquinas. So let me describe very briefly the problem, uh, the, the view of the mind held by Thomas Aquinas and, and medieval philosophers, medieval uh, ontological realists about universals generally, and how that solves all of these problems. So because, uh, now this, this, the view that I'm going to describe is called hylomorphism. Uh, it's, it comes from the Greek word hylo, which means uh, matter, and then morph, which means form. So what you're saying is that a person, a human person, is a, fundamentally a composite of matter and form. Now, because scholastics were realists about universals, they believed that uh, universals inhered in all sorts of objects in the world, and this included human persons. Uh, therefore, uh, these universals, when combined in a certain way, produced w what they called a form. It is an organizational structure to something. Um, and that organizational structure, in a way, was, was the essence of that thing. Okay, so within Aristotelian metaphysics, and I mentioned this a few times in this series, there are four uh, fundamental causes. There's the material cause, which is just the material substance that something is made of. The efficient cause, which is the series of kind of mechanical, physical events that led to the production of something. Um, there's the formal cause, which is really the, the universals comprising it and the essence of it, and the organizational structure that it has as a result of instantiating those universals that it instantiates. And then there's the, the final cause, which is teleology or purpose. Now, Descartes' mechanistic conception of nature eliminated formal and final causality from the equation so that only efficient and material causes could be allowed. Now, the argument that he gives against um, uh, final causality in one of the meditations is that there cannot be final causality because for there to be final causality and for it to be discernible by us, we would have to presume on the intentions and purposes of God. But God is radically omnipotent, as the nominalists thought him to be, and so that's presumptuous. We can't know anything about the purposes of God. God is infinite will. Okay, so... Uh, if that's true, then also because Descartes was anomalous to reject realism at universal, so formal causality is out. But on the hylomorphist view, all matter is informed by form. There's no such thing as matter as distinct from form. And so what a hylomorphist would basically say is that the, the soul what we think of as the soul is really the form of the person, the essence of the person. It's universals forming the soul. And because all universals are, are instantiated within physical objects and are so closely in, interconnected with them, that explains the problem of interaction. It's just a combination of universals being instantiated. So that solves the interaction problem. It also solves the problem of personal identity because 
if person A instantiates the same combination of universals as person B, then it's the same person, right? It also solves the problem of other minds because people have their, their form, their universals that they instantiate. Um, so th that's just a very brief description of how hylomorphism can deal with all sorts of problems in the philosophy of mind and how modernist uh, mechanistic assumptions can't. And another, the final interesting point I want to make before concluding this video is that a lot of these problems of philosophy, uh, like the interaction problem, for example, or the hard problem of consciousness, these aren't really philosophical problems. What they are is consequences of modernist philosophical assumptions. I want to hammer that home. In other words, if you assume that universals don't exist, um, then and you take a mechanistic conception of matter and nature, well, then you're led to the hard problem, inexorably, right? It, it, it's just an implication of that. So these so-called philosophical problems, like the hard problem or the interaction problem, aren't really problems. What I want to suggest is that they are reductio ad absurdums of modernist philosophical assumptions. They are actually reasons why you should reject modernist philosophical assumptions. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, there there are other people who've seen problems with physicalist views of mind and Cartesian dualist interactionist problems and have become idealists, for example. And you can do that, but there are all sorts of um, counterintuitive assumptions that you have to make if you do. Um, so one of the advantages of hylomorphism is that if you agree to be a realist about universals and you agree that people instantiate form and that the form of a person is therefore that person's soul, which explains interaction, personal identity, and all these other problems. You don't have to make the counterintuitive assumption that all of, of reality is mind-dependent. Because most people agree, most people think intuitively that, you know, the existence of this book is independent of my mind, or of any mind, for, for that matter. Um, of any human mind, at least. Uh, so yeah, so so that's it. That's the final point I want to make. Uh, that a lot of these so-called problems of philosophy are really reductio ad absurdums of modernist philosophical assumptions. And this is something that I'm going to pursue later on. Uh, and this is not the only example of that. Think of the is-ought problem too. That's that's a consequence of rejecting final causality in nature. If you think that final causality does exist and that there is purpose in nature, then there is a uh, natural law which is normatively binding and therefore by studying nature you can come to normative conclusions and the Isot gap is bridged. But if you reject final causality, you get the gap. So the Isot problem can be thought of as a reductio ad absurdum of the argument that there is no final causality in nature. But that's another example. The point is there are all sorts of philosophical problems that are just the result of modernity. And so modernity has given us all sorts of trouble. Uh, and that's, that's that for now. Uh, more to come. Thank you for listening.